be like going, seriously? How are you today? Good. All right. So, DerbyCon, what's it like this year? How many have we uh, got here that have been here in previous years? <laughs> Clapping. I can't see you. How many have been to three prior Derby Cons? All right. And two? I won't, I won't do the ones. That's, that's embarrassing. Almost as embarrassing as having OpenOffice fail to load your presentation. That was actually, for those maths we challenged, being to all five means you've been to four previous, right? Okay. Who did I not count four previous? It's okay. Kind of like the, uh, the airline pilot. Uh, the tower has finally given us clearance to leave. We'll be uh, leaving 30 minutes late and yet making it up in the air, and we'll get you on the ground two minutes ahead of time. My goodness. All right. I am done with this. Hard reboot. See how it likes that. How are you? I already said that. Thank you. <laughs> it's a good thing I'm not giving a live demo. Today we are going to talk about grokking all the chisel. Why? Why would I talk about such a thing? Is it because I know everything? No. Is it because we live in an industry where knowing everything is what we're called to do? Yes. Why? Well, because that's what people want. How often? All the time. So when I get back into things, we're going to start a little game of pattern recognition. I will have pairs of slides. You'll see a pattern on the first slide, and on the second slide, it'll explain what it was. Challenge for you, yell out what the thing is before I switch to the next slide. I've got 104 slides and 50 minute slot, so as you can tell, I'm not going to give you a whole lot of time. So speak up, I don't want to see hands, just be rude. You're ugly. <laughs> Getting just warmed up, all right. Should we go again? Yeah, let's not have, oh, seriously. I've not had this much difficulty in a very long time with the uh, presentation. So I could start actually saying the patterns and you could, no, that's not going to work. So I suppose I should introduce myself. My name is Atlas. I've been redefining Binary Ninja in my own life for over a decade now. So uh, that may make you inspired to listen to me. It may not, but you're here. So. I'm going to assume that that's, that's okay. Yeah. Yay! Linux is becoming the Windows operating system. Reboot. <laughs> Seriously. There we go. Rocking all the sizzle. A passionate way to be excellent at binary and computer systems and life. <laughs> what is it? It's regex, substitution with a field carry. Very important. Okay, what's this? It'll print out the usernames. Of yes, thank you. Grok, it's an awk command to print usernames from Etsy password. Next, what is this? Descending, Descending loop in what language? Python. As you can tell, each of these has multi-layers. See how far you can get. I wanted to include everybody all the time. You will find some that you don't know. Hey! <laughs> What's the pattern here? Hugs. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. He did say that he would see my talk in some way, shape, or form. I'm here. Don't worry. 
Seriously. All right. This is incredible. <laughs> Thank you. I think it actually may be the stupid USB port. Thank you. How about this one? You get, you get it yet? It's C doing what? Prince Fibonacci through 89. There we go. I got it back. What is this? It's a GUID. What kind of GUID? It's a fake GUID. It doesn't really work. The GUID for the GPT BIOS boot partition, ha, I don't need EFI. If you, if you look through the binary there. What is this? Ooh. Base 64. I love this one. And of Hello World. What is this? LM hash for empty password. Who here has been to uh, SANS 560? You should all have said that. How about this? That's not base 64. That's base 32 for hello world. Multi uh, more than two equal signs pushes you into base 32. Spit it out, hex. Assembly. Jump. Yes. Jump back two. This is an infinite loop, followed by obfuscation. Jump back negative one, but it's a two byte instruction, so it takes the FF as the start of a new instruction. EB80 jumps back 125 bytes from the start of that instruction. Go, Tim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> x86 in instruction used to talk to hardware also my favorite way to refer to Ed Scotus right there with the hat um, also the way VMware at least used to talk on the uh, the backdoor channel between host and guest yes it's binary go further <laughs> it's an RF preamble uh, specified in 802. Everything. So wired and wireless. Turns out they're not that different. Anybody who says RF cat, it wins. RF cat for. Believe it or not, you can tell that that's an ASK symbol or an ASK signal at 924.850 megahertz. ARM, thumb, and thumb two instructions. These are uh, these are preambles for or, uh, prologues for functions. Very helpful to know. As is this for x86 Microsoft style. You notice the uh, move EDI EDI hook for 32-bit instructions. This is the man page for get s. <laughs> Never use get s. <laughs> I love that. PK zip header. Thanks, Phil. Sorry. I know you're dead, but you did great things. Elf header, yes. It's the ad symbol. The best symbol in the world. CRC magic number for zip. Who knew that one? <laughs> Empty string, MB5. He got it. Yeah, very good. <laughs> Gotta give that away though. Shaw one of nothing. These are magic numbers for MD5. You'll notice this being reverse of this and this being the reverse of this. Anyone do any hardware hacking? JTAG, thank you. Executable header for what? PE, which works for DOS, Windows, and everything. <laughs> yeah, that was a gimme. <laughs> PDF. Master boot record, anybody? Right down here. The very, very last part of the boot sector. Come on, you know this one. Microsoft Office, doc file zero. DHCP magic cookie, actually, this, all sorts of places. 
What's that? Speak up. Speak up. You've got lots to say. I want to hear it, guys. Okay, I had to look this one up. I'll, I'll give you that one. These are PGP magic numbers in, that I stole out of the file repository. Any other embedded stuff? Used for most, a lot of communication between embedded uh, components on a board. This as well. For I to C, a slower version, but it's, uh, it's a lot denser on wires on your PCB. <laughs> I don't expect anybody to, to know this unless you're a close personal friend, but I, I'd like to throw things out there. Stage three CTF quals, the vulnerability. It's right here. You have a stack variable that you read into from a socket, and then you run S scan F into a stack buffer of a much smaller size. I wanted to point out this is the symbolic view representation using the locations. This is the read function. This is the scanf function. Here's the buffer that is read into and then used. Here's the size of what we're writing into. There's the size that we read, the, the, the limit of how much we could read into it. To grok something is to understand it very deeply and fully in a very meaningful way. I like to, I like to think of it as an intimate knowledge. Um, yeah, we won't go there. There, there are five way, five levels of understanding. You have the buzzword bingo. I've heard of it once and I can throw it out there in a meeting to gain popularity and, and let pe other neophytes think that I know what I'm talking about. Uh, I can talk about it and I actually understand some of the concepts, but I really have never done it. I've done it once. And actually, this is the breakover point. This is one of the most powerful things in the growth of knowledge is I not only can talk about it, but I've done it. We move into the veteran where I do this on a fairly regular basis or I've done it before maybe 10 times and I, I, I've chewed on things. And finally, the master. I do it every time, almost all the time, correctly the first time. This talk is about grokking all the things. Why? Because we as an industry, we're in a, we're in a losing, winning battle. I don't care how you, how you view it. One of those fits. It is one where we are called upon to know everything all the time. Your boss may be nice, but ultimately, you're better at your job if you know everything all the time. Now, don't go in acting like you know everything all the time. That's a different topic. Being able to identify patterns, like what we were just rolling through, can be the key to solving many very valuable problems in your job. Whether you're a pen tester, if you're in forensics, uh, if you're a reverse engineer, or if you're delving into new areas of research, any time that you're able to identify a pattern for what it is as a holistic thing, MD5 or uh, uh, Base64 or Hex, and then can then continue to chunk on it to figure out more and draw, suck the marrow out of it. Your job, your passion, your life becomes that much easier and better, and you're better at what you do, and you enjoy it more normally. I want to point out that we're seeing the conglomeration, the, the culmination of multiple areas of penetration testing and research coming together into new things that require you bringing your skills to a table with other people who bring different skills to the table and a meshing of them and the ability to work together using pattern matching and knowledge. We're seeing hardware and software reverse engineering projects that, that work hand in hand. We're seeing cyber, physical, social engineering in pen tests. We're seeing IT and OT for you control systems engineers, coming together and we're actually breaching not only the technical boundaries but the cultural boundaries as well. So we need to be at the top of our game. We need to know everything. We need to show up and be able to just say, this goes to that, that goes to this, go, this goes to that, right? Or at least be able to say, I can figure that out. But there's too many things, Atlas, I, I, got, a, I got a life. 
Absolutely. I completely and wholeheartedly understand and priorities are priorities. I have a wife and three daughters. I have a, I have a farm. Um, I only work about 50 hours a week and I only travel about 24, uh, 25% of the time. These are boundaries that my wife and I have put in place to protect my life so that I'm not on my third wife as I'm trying to retire and losing her. However, there are things that we can do as we strive to gain knowledge in a world where it will take everything that we have to offer it, chew it up, spit it out, and say, you're not enough. One thing that I remember from incident handling and forensics training years, years, years ago is that those two facets of my life that I, that I enjoyed so much, they took everything that I could bring and then everything that the guy next to me could bring. And I wanted to get better. I wanted to stop, step up and be valuable. Tom Liston, lovely man. You'll see him later on. I got a picture of him. Tom Liston is the epitome of the impromptu expert. The man takes manuals home over the weekend and becomes an expert in Cisco, foo, whatever that was necessary for the next week's engagement. I got to work with the gentleman. He's, he's amazing to watch. This is actually what a lot of our jobs need, is the ability to know enough about some things that we can take that stub and fill it in as needed. There are other things that we can do to allow ourselves to grow and to become more than we are and to fill in those gaps as we needed. If you hadn't guessed, we can't know everything. I have a finite amount of RAM in my brain. I know because there are things from when I was about five that I don't remember. Why? Because I've squished it out and rewritten over it. I think there's a flash thing where I can only overwrite the RAM so many times, but I'm not going to get into that tonight. Uh, play with your stuff. Let me rephrase that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that can help too. Um, play with technology. Spend time, take a breath. You know, I, I hate to say this, this is hard for me to admit, but I like doing things when nobody else knows that I'm doing it because I don't want the pressure of having to answer, yeah, no, it didn't work out. You know? um, yeah, it's necessary to just play. To take the pressure off, spend a little bit of time, just kind of get to know something. Watch for the patterns. We are all pattern matchers here. First of all, humans are created to be pattern matchers, and I believe that a lot of people who don't come to HackerCons squish it out because it doesn't seem that important. I think that you're here probably most likely means that you're a pattern matcher and you welcome it. So play with technology. Learn about technology. Look for the patterns. Figure out, well, this didn't work and why? Because that actually, that failure leads into a better understanding than you would otherwise have. Teach. Pass on what you have learned. Mentor. They are different. Invest in the lives of other people, and you yourself will get far more in return than you would ever imagine. But we must focus our energy and our time. We have a time and money problem, right? Those who have too much time don't have any money, and those who have too much money don't have any time, and you have to make decisions that set up boundaries so that you get the ample amount of both. How do we focus our time? First of all, focus on the things that you love. This is, uh, this is general, uh, general expertise from a whole bunch of things, sources that I've read. I'll touch on one in a little bit. Do what you love and limit your scope. Be broad, and then deep dive where you really want to, or where it's really necessary. Trust me, an organization needing you to be an expert in something, even if it's not your passionate love, can still be a great value to you. Identify your own weaknesses, soberly assessing your own stuff. Put hubris aside, put your ego aside, this is just you. You're, you don't, you're not going into your boss. This is just you. Assess your own weaknesses 
And see them as challenges. Don't see them as suck. Okay? Make a plan. And then sharpen the saw. Stephen Covey, in his Seven Habits of Highly, highly Effective People, seventh habit was sharpen the saw. Improve your tooling. Improve your mind. Invest in yourself. Because if you don't, it's a lot harder to ramp up quickly when you're, not, when you're needed than when you walk in with a lot more knowledge to begin with. Spend at least four hours a week playing for pay in your work, unless, of course, you're like a daycare person or something outside of IT security. If you're in this field, you tell your boss I said so. Then come talk to me. It's mandatory. Unless they don't care about you, and you're kind of just a... If you're a replaceable cog, that's a different thing. But i got to say, if you're an InfoSec, even in an organization where replaceable cogs are what they're after, you still need to do this. But don't just do it at work. I mean, that, you know, how many here passionately love what you do? Passionately enjoy InfoSec? Okay, put your hands down. How many here don't? How many here, computers are a way of making a decent amount of money? Good, because get the fuck out of my room. Go. Right now. <laughs> so we all talk about this balance thing, and, you know, I can, I can balance. But in reality, we're talking tension. We have differing priorities pressing against the things that we have to offer. You've got to make sure that that tension places you where you need to be and where your family needs you to be. So how do we sharpen the saw, really? First of all, believe in you. I'm not being jerky, cliche crap. If you don't believe in you, who does? Maybe somebody else's belief in you may make you believe in yourself a little bit, but if you don't think that you can do something, 99 out of 100, you're right. Allow yourself to revel in the process of growth. Sit down. If you don't love that green on black, or whatever color scheme you want, command line, and tinkering with what, whatever you can get to, why not? Is it because you really haven't had enough positive time just kind of enjoying it and learning and growing and, and seeing that you're investing in your future as well as enjoyment? Allow your curiosity to get the best of you regularly for a time. I mean, you, you, can, you can just say, ah, no, no boundaries and, and waste all sorts of time and not get any work done, then you lose your job and you work at McDonald's. But on a regular basis, for a certain time, let curiosity get the better of you. Envision the hacker and the person that you want to become. Soberly assess where you're at. Figure out the kind of guy you want to be. Do you want to be doing binary reverse engineering? Do you want to be doing forensic analysis, malware analysis? Do you want to be doing uh, pen testing or incident handling? What kind of hacker do you want to be? What kind of person do you want to be? Do you want to be a dependable guy? Do you want to be an, somebody with integrity where people look at you and say, yeah, it looks like he knows something, but I don't trust him. Or do you want to be able to roll up and say, this is what I think, and have people say, yeah, I can not only see that I, that I can trust him, but his reputation precedes him. Imagine that person that you want to be and make a plan and then make it so. 40 years old, I'm still asking, what do I want to be when I grow up? i got a few ideas, I'll tell you. But uh, I'm still pushing that vision forward, saying, who do I want to be? What's the path there? And then spending my time diligently improving my skills, improving my experience, improving my relationships to get there. So some uh, technical tips. If you're a pen tester, binary pen tests, right? You know, because web and binary is still kind of separate sometimes. Do you have a good flow of vulnerability information? Do you know about the DH? Uh, do you know? Hey, Village. come here. Leakage. Do you know about Heartbleed before it becomes really public or, or before Egypt has written an exploit for it? Do you know about the Bash stuff? 
there's an eyeball on my water. <laughs> Do you learn these things before they're made big because everybody else is talking about them really poorly, by the way? Do you have that information flow? Do you know when new things hit? And then, when they hit your favorite tool set. How much do you know about vulnerability types? Because you need to learn each vulnerability type very well. How do they work? How do they not work? What are the things that you can do to break them? Or that they can be broken for you if you're doing pen tests? Some require tools. Some just require Netcat or Python or whatever your favorite socket generator is. How do vulns work? What are the, pick an exploit toolkit. Metasploit's a great start. May not be the only thing that you want to have in your tool belt, but I know in recent years, I wouldn't be caught without it. Core, maybe? Canvas? Okay, keep your comments to yourself. Don't be too afraid to make connections into the underground. Um, be careful how you do so. But I was just having this conversation at dinner the other night with a, with a guy who actually paid to uh, have a subscription to the RBN. <laughs> and so he'd get malware, and the first malware he downloads, it doesn't work, so he calls up tech support <laughs> for the Russian business network. <laughs> From a payphone in a different city. <laughs> and they're very business, -like. anyway. Be careful how you do it, but keep tabs as you, as you feel comfortable on the underground. Post-exploitation. So, I got this vuln, I got an exploit for it, now what? No interpreter. <laughs> that's K-N-O-W, no, not no. Um, that, that's, a, that's a first start. No other payloads. Meterpreter might not always work. No other payloads, maybe just a shovel and a shell out using bash, dev, tcp. What do you do then, though? How many of you know what to grab as soon as you hit a box? Would you hit a box running, or would you go back and ask your friends, okay, I got this, I got the C prompt now, like, what do I want to do? Understand the post-exploitation very, very well. One of the things that, uh, that can be incredibly powerful is knowing PowerShell if you're hacking Windows boxes, or a well-known shell scripting language like Bash or Perl. Yes, I realize Bash is even more powerful than we ever knew. Um, understand what to do when you get there. Netcat gender benders. Who's heard of those? All right. I personally use Netcat gender benders where you've got a client attached to a client and a server attached to a server to gain access to a back-end database through three layers of security. Because of the way firewall rules were set up, it's amazing. I, I give full credit to my friend here who's like hiding just a little bit um, for coming up with Netcat gender benders. And I've used them in my everyday life. SANS 560, 504, I know this isn't supposed to be like a sales pitch, but in my life, these have made significant differences in this part of my world. Pen tests for web. Understand the protocols that we use, HTTP. How do I type it and actually interact with Netcat? How do I do SSL? How does that work? I mean, with Heartbleed, we should all be just gushing with information on how SSL works. Um, are we? There's more, uh, there's more to be learned there. Understand the tools for web, Burp, Recon NG, SOAP UI. How am I doing on time here? Okay, half a mile. Figure out the vulnerability types. Web is actually one of the coolest playgrounds for pen testing. Why? Because you have so much power without even having to go binary. You're able to use Netcat or Python Interactive Shell just to own the crap out of all sorts of amazing things. Understand your, your vuln types. Let your brain linger a little, little bit, though. Because uh, cross-site request forgery is amazing. Cross-site scripting is amazing, but there's more to it. Your browsers are a great attack surface. PDF viewers, uh, Flash, HTML5. HTML5 still has so much to be looked at. If you're interested in taking web to the next level in your life, start looking at the attack surface in the browser. Understand how they work, 
and how to break them. There are lots of uh, discoveries and disclosures and proof of concepts already out there. Understand crypto. I already kind of touched on that with SSL. And then make sure that you're able to get in the middle of whatever, whenever, however. Turns out hacking is a lot about slicing things up, getting in the middle of otherwise uh, colluded information streams. If you're able to get in the middle of, of all sorts of data, it's almost always beneficial. And a little plug for, uh, for SANS 542, 642. Kevin Johnson couldn't make it to the talk because he's a lame brain. But, uh, but some of his guys have come. Thank you very much. If you're into hardware, reading chip data sheets can be a big deal. Making sense of the electronic parts and knowing which sections of a data sheet to look at for what you're after. How to get at the data, uh, the debug ports. How to manipulate a microcontroller. Finding data sheets is actually a skill that needs to be taught. I should write a, I, I should write a training session on that. Um, I go to octopart.com to start. Octopart.com provides you with the ability to search for things that Google will not tell you. Understanding the basic interface protocols that are at use in embedded hardware is very valuable as well. SPI and I2C are sure things. You have to know them. Get an Arduino, hard code bit banging these protocols so that you understand how they work. We can talk later if you want help with that. Uh, USB, understanding how USB works. This is a little more complex. This isn't something that you can just kind of slap two wires down and and make happen, but understanding how it works and how to make a, a microcontroller with a USB controller actually talk on USB is a lot harder than you might think. PCI, if you're getting into older machines or just in the, in the middle of your own machine, very good to know. And Ethernet, of course, every embedded device is, is trying to do Ethernet or Wi-Fi anymore. Uh, or some other RF protocols, which I, I prefer. Understanding electricity, really big. Knowing that 90 volts across between two arms is enough to kill you by stopping your heart, that's a good thing to know. Um, understanding how to drop a 5-volt line to 3.3 volts using just passive devices, pretty good stuff to know. Electricity is pretty cool. It kind of affects all of our lives. It's, it's a good thing to know. One of my personal favorites, radio frequency. Uh, understanding the basics and the advanced topics of how radio works. Um, I, I got a class actually on that. It's a wonderful topic. For hardware, understanding the tools means that you have bus sniffers. You, you're able to tap lines and get data off the lines between a couple different components. Uh, you have some maybe tools that allow you to inject and take over a bus. RFCAD allows you to uh, interact, send and receive on sub gigahertz stuff. HackRF by our, my good buddy uh, Michael Osman is, I'm sorry, it's the best uh, software-defined radio tool that I've seen. GoodFET is a very hackerish version of a debugger. Uh, also drives SPI very well. I say hackerish in the actually the most complimentary fashion. I use GoodFETs all the time, even though I've got more expensive tools because I'm more close to the bits and able to adjust things as I need them, not as the software needs them for the tools that I bought. Arduino or some other ad hoc tool of choice, I sometimes will use an RF cat because I've got the firmware, I, I, it gives me USB and you know, there, there are things that I can do with it, but an Arduino is, I think, just a must. This is tech summary, summarizing for, for the technology. Get in the middle of things where you can manipulate and interpret them. Uh, I, have, I had a picture of a, vivi a vivisection. One of my favorite tools is called vivisect. So I thought I'd throw this great picture of a vivisection, but it would be like, I, it, it burns your eyes. It's not actually a pleasant view. Understand how things work and understand how to prove how things work. This is the, this is the foundation that I think you all can reverberate with as soon as you can walk in here, just given your experience so far. Hunting. Oftentimes, I think my biggest challenge 
that I have to face on a daily basis is believing that somebody's made a mistake that I can go hunt down and find. The second I don't believe that, I've already hampered my hunting. So I have to at least do the mental exercise of saying, yes, one bug every thousand lines of code, gajillion lines of code out there, there's bugs, and I will find them. Balance your new and your old skill set development. We gotta keep the wheels on, right? I still need to know how to program in Bash and how to walk, even though I'm learning Perl or Python or Ruby. I recommend highly invest in something new and give it a few weeks or maybe a couple months to enjoy it, to suck it up, suck the marrow out of it. Sorry, that's, uh, that almost went somewhere else. I've got visions of Don Weber going through my head. Suck it up. Anyway. <clears throat> Suggestions for the more personal side of life. Spend time being a normal person. Maybe, maybe at least an hour a week. Um, you know, take your, take your Darth Vader wife out on, on a nice date. Leave the kids at home, the little stormtroopers. Work on communication skills. If there's one thing that I can't say enough to very brilliant, technologically advanced people, is to speak in terms of your audience. Talk about what's important to them. I'm talking to power engineers all the time that are saying, the power grid is messed up, dude, but nobody listens. So there's a disconnect in relationship, and, and it's not all engineers' fault, but we can cover so much ground by thinking in terms of business and money and risk and the things that are important to the people who make the decisions. Make contracts with your, with your coworkers. I will do this given these constraints, and then fulfill them. It's like programming, you, who's written a function and had to write up a, a contract for what that function will do, what the inputs are, and what the outputs are. Same thing. Turns out business isn't that different from coding. Scoping. I, I'm sorry, I know I'm going to be called the SANS sales guy, but SANS 560 talks a ton about scoping a pen test. In fact, it... it it's a little larger than I would have thought would be a really nice part of the class, but in reality, it's one of the most important things for setting yourself up for success. Learn project management. Figure out how to get where you're at to where you want to be. Again, this is just like coding. You have this code, you end up there at the end, you figure out the path around to get to that end that fits all the needs that you have and the desires of your heart. Figure out if you're pen testing, figure out where Oday fits in. This is, this is a big question. A lot of people don't have access to Oday. Uh, it is kind of costly, sometimes 40K, maybe a couple hundred K, depending on what it is. If you have it, make sure that you're applying it only where it makes benefit for your customers. Um, sometimes that means all the time, depends and get to know all of your binary hex and other magic numbers. Identify, just play. Go to your, guy, go to your friends at work and say, hey, what's this? You seen that? Kind of makes you feel good because you know when they don't, but it helps you grow. A couple words about environment. Take control of your environment. For, figure out what you need. Sometimes you need music. Sometimes it's thrash metal. Sometimes it's the Tron soundtrack. Sometimes it's George Winston. I'm, I'm telling you, when, when I get into reading mode of certain things, man, George just sets me in the mood. <laughs> yes, indeed. Sometimes just quiet. Set yourself time to dwell on the problems that you're dealing with. Uh, let's see. And then think and process. Take the time that you have. There are a lot of things you do that don't take every ounce of your brain. I know for me, 
washing dishes, and rototilling. I've come up with some of the coolest exploits and the greatest business decisions I've ever made. Rototilling. Maybe it just kind of jars the ideas loose or something. Um, led to the hiring of who has become one of my closest friends, and, uh, and he and I have rained down terror on the power industry. Anyway, cool, cool stuff. Get to know what your mind and your heart need and what your circumstances allow. You got two newborns? Maybe you got twins that are newborn? Make sure you prioritize things right. Make boundaries. You gotta prioritize schedule. You gotta leave yourself a chance to breathe. I got a half hour in the morning that I try to breathe. Spend a little time praying, reading the Bible, breathing, doing exercise. Turns out, you could be red hot and burn out. But diligence, continued focus on the goal, and slow, hard, smart work wins far better than burning out. I'm just going to leave that one where it sits. Why? <laughs> Says the man who gave me caffeine today. Thank you. John Cleese was asked to give a speech on creativity. Um, and it's amazing. I've left the URL here. Google it or, or search on YouTube. Uh, well worth the half hour. And he talks about that he doesn't know how to be creative. But he does know how to make it so that you can be and how to make it so that you can't be creative. He talks a ton about great stuff. Watch it. Humor helps, too. Um, Helps us learn, helps us be creative. John Cleese calls out actually that humor makes you creative. And so, you know, every once in a while seeing Ed Scotus or Kevin Johnson or Don Weber, you know, in Tutu, I did not do the pictures. I won't tell you who did, but their initials are. You gotta enjoy the people that you, uh, that you work with and make friends and, uh, and figure out how to, how to work well together. Sometimes practicing with your lightsaber really does help take over the power grid. Or you got to enjoy your bling. This is Tom Liston. Tony Schwartz wrote a paper a, a while back. How, six keys to being excellent at anything. It's one of the best reads I've done in a decade. Pursue what you love. Do the hardest work first. Practice intensely. 90 minutes. Not more than five hours a day. Seek expert feedback, but don't do it all the time. Hey, Ed, how's this? Hey, Ed, how's this? Hey, Ed, how's this? Ed, was, Ed has been my mentor for many years. Because you can overwhelm yourself. Go grow, and then come back and seek input. Take regular renewal breaks. Take a breath. Go have, no, I wouldn't say go have a smoke. But go, smoke breaks actually are amazing, even for a non-smoker. Ritualized practice, 10,000 hours to be an expert. If you break that down to averaging 25 hours a week at work, 50 weeks a year, that takes eight years. I'm betting that you can improve on that by hobby and by efficiency, getting more than 25 hours a week. Take care of your health. For about eight years, or eight years, yeah. For about eight months, I've been dealing with, uh, with health issues. It's been very, very difficult. My head's become kind of cloudy and I've been having to Focus on getting better. This is me. And you can't see it very well, but there's little dark spots at the top of these roots. And those are infections that have been draining me. Never figured dental health would uh, cause me to actually have brain drain and energy drain. Uh, my wife tried to tell me it was because I'm getting old. No, she really didn't. Take care of yourself. Tech ninjas, pay attention. You want to become experienced at the breadth. You want to deep dive where you're passionate, and where the company needs you to be passionate. Communicate well in terms of other people. Set expectations. Thank you, Ed. Learned that from you. Commit and then over deliver. So what's that mean? You commit to <laughs> not too much and then you do more. Think and speak in terms of the mission the goals of the team and of the business. 
It's not a personal offense. You don't say, I don't run RPC out to the DMZ because it's stupid. Chances are probably pretty good you're smart enough to turn that into logical language of why it's a stupid idea, right? Do expect to be respectfully educating your boss. They don't know who you are. They don't, they don't know what you need to do to be amazing. Okay? But expect to be educated by them as well on how to achieve the goals together. They are your best tool if you know how to use them properly. Pointy-haired bosses, if there are any of you left in the room. Building a team of cyber ninjas is not easy. It's not clear-cut path. There's no book already written, although I am thinking about the, uh, the rights. Um, care and feeding of your cyber ninja. You need to learn how to keep them happy by helping them grow and helping them succeed and helping them to enjoy their focus. Make sure that you expect respectful behavior and then give it. And I got to tell you, I have worked for teams where the management understood setting an idea at a team identity. And I've worked for teams where the management didn't understand that was their job. And it was miserable. We didn't have any identity. It was just the contract. And oh, we work for really cool people. Okay. How about we create room for us to be people? Make room for your cyber ninjas and help them to succeed. They need your protection. You'll never get as much out of a team unless they love you. You can scare them, you can beat them, you can incent them with money or trips to Aruba. But if they love you, you'll get far more out of them and you'll get more out of it. But you've got to love them first. To summarize, crock all the chisel, at least all of it that you can. Never stop growing. If you do, hopefully you're not breathing. That came out a little wrong. Don't stop growing until you're dead. How's that? <laughs> when in doubt, focus on what you love. But look for opportunities that there's need for because that need allows you opportunity to burn bright, to let people take notice. Soberly assess your weak areas and treat them as challenges, not thinking that you suck, just knowing that there's more to grow and take advantage of it. Sharpen the saw, communicate well, learn the tech and the business, and then play. Thank you very much.